Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. We're in the Cabela's podcast studio this week. Flick, if you um, will hold still and not jingle your collar tags, I will appreciate it. Great show in store for you. Ed Bailey, one of the gurus, one of the founders of the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. We'll talk about all things versatile hunting dogs with a slightly scientific perspective. That's his background but also great tips on picking puppies, dog behavior and training strategies, you name it, Ed knows it, and we've got some great questions for him, so stand by there. Of course, a public access tip, some hunting strategies and dog handling advice. Let's go on a few adventures together, some tips and tactics. It's all here at the Upland Nation podcast. So glad you could join me. Hey. Were you at Pheasant Fest? I was. I'm sorry if I didn't get to say hello. I was kind of tied to the booth, uh, the pointer shotgun booth, and my booth were right next to each other, and, well, that was by design. They're a sponsor of the TV show, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Andy, and everybody else at Pointer Shotguns. It was an incredible affair. If you weren't there, record-setting attendance, 32,000 pheasant hunting, quail hunting, bird dog-loving junkies out there learning all about conservation, all about public access, and all about all the things that we love. Thank you for stopping by if you did. Great to see some of the folks I've seen at many, many other Pheasant Fests and then other events like our Fur Feathers Friends Military Salute. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for supporting Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, the Upland Nation Podcast, Wing Shooting USA TV, and Pointer Shotguns, among others. You know, one of the most fascinating things I learned at Pheasant Fest yet again this year is how important public access is. If you take my survey every year, you know that finding land to hunt is our biggest challenge. It's also the biggest reason people quit hunting or don't start hunting to begin with. So still doing that. Got a great destination for you, one of my favorite places in Nebraska coming up, but all sorts of other stuff going on in that world as well. Walking down the aisles of Pheasant Fest, one of my good friends, a uh, sponsor of this show. Thank you again, Fred Bohm at sageandbreaker.com. Gun care and gun cleaning products crafted at the highest caliber. Got a little taste, not literally, of their new firearms grease and messed around with their new gun cleaning chamois over there. If you'd like to learn more about them and watch some of those videos, I guarantee you'll learn something. Go to sageandbreaker.com. Also there in fine fettle, Pete Fisher and the Fisher Boys representing our friends at Dogtra. Learn more about the T&B Duel two-dog training collar system at dogtra.com. All right, joining me on the line from way over there uh, in the Great White North, so to speak, is uh, Ed Bailey. Ed, welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much, Scott. You know, you and I have talked uh, once or twice over the years. Uh, Most people would know your name as an author and a um, and a columnist for Gun Dog Magazine. You are also deeply involved in developing the so-called Green Book for the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. You're also a professor and animal behaviorist at the University of Guelph. So, uh, well, uh, am I pronouncing that yeah, right? You know, retired. okay, you're retired now. Um, yeah, yeah. You know a little bit about dogs. You know a little bit about uh, behavior. Let's jump right in. So, how did you get involved in what became the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association? What what, what prompted you and and the other folks who who founded that group to to to, to band together? Well, uh, the the whole thing started with with Bodo Bodo Winterheld, of course, when Bodo immigrated from from Germany and into Canada and uh, wanted to test dogs. The only thing here was uh, AKC or CKC or uh, American field, and uh, his dogs weren't able to do that sort of stuff, and no dog is except pointers and setters, really. And so Aboto started to, uh, as a testing wool back in about 1956, and he and uh, a fellow named Doug Hume uh, translated the German regulations for the tests into English, and 
and they sent it out to various people. I happened to get a hold of a copy of it. I was uh, in Montana at the time teaching at the university there. And uh, I then moved to Canada, and uh, uh, one of the, I knew about the rules, and I also met a friend uh, named Henry Taubel, Henry Taubel. And his father was Dr. Carl Taubel, who's the who was the person in Germany for versatile hunting dogs. He was the he was the ultimate judge and ultimate breeder of German hunting dogs. And he himself was the wire person or Drotar, they call it. And I met Henrik and we talked about this the dogs. I had with me a a, a young Griffon, four months old when I came here. And um, so I, I I knew about the German tests. I knew about the German regulations. I knew uh, all the stuff about the versatile hunting dogs. We weren't called versatile hunting dogs at the time. They were called just continentals. And uh, I uh, heard about Bodo. And I, I looked him up. I didn't get to talk to him at that point. But later on, I had contact with him, and uh, we had the, uh, he wanted to start a test, a testing program. So he had the first test and asked me if I would be one of the judges. And that's how I got involved with what became NAVDA. That must, that must have been yeah. a- actually kind of, uh, kind of intimidating to, uh, to uh, be asked to judge dogs based on a European standard that... Uh, that was literally just translated, and uh, how did that, I mean, how do you feel about that? Oh, no problem. <laughs> I, I'm really, uh, because I had, I had one of my own, and so I, I knew how they were supposed to work, and, and uh, I was very familiar with the German rules and regulations, so there was uh, no, no problem for me, really. Um, the one problem we ran into in the very first test was... Um, Bodo being uh, strictly out of the German uh, code book for judging dogs, um, one of the tests was to search in in cover uh, water and cattails and uh, what in German is called Schiff. And uh, the dogs, no, no dogs knew about this except his own. So he had a, a person... There was a young guy with a German uh, short hair, and uh, the dog had no idea what he was supposed to do to search without any game in the in, in, through all these cattails. And Bodo said to the person, "Okay, you can pick your dog up and go home." Yeah, thanks for and coming. Well, here's your lovely parting gift. Yeah, in, in, and, in, and I said, "Whoa!" <laughs> uh, then I said, I took Bodo aside and I said, "Bodo." I know that's how it's done, but this is the very first time. If you want people to come back, you're going to have to bend a little. Let him finish the test, and 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 you'll get his score. He gets a zero for this, okay? But he will at least have had the experience of what the whole thing is about, and maybe he'll spread the word. So he says, "Bodo says you're right." And that's what we did. That became sort of the the, the hallmark of the whole of the NAFTA movement was the. Uh, bend over backwards to help the handler. And it's so true, and I can testify to that from a week ago where I um, helped out at uh, at our own chapter's uh, natural ability test. And I, I ended up being the kind of the interpreter for, for a while there with all the folks who were in it for the first time and telling them that the, in, this is one of the few organizations where the judges actually want you to succeed, and they will do what they can to help you succeed. And sure enough, it paid off for so many of the folks who are brand new to this whole world. And it's, it's neat to see that 50 years later, you know, that it's still happening out there. Now, uh, the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association is is built around uh, the versatile hunting dog. And if you had to describe a versatile hunting dog as opposed to, uh, you've alluded to setters and pointers, and, and there's others out there as well, whether it's a spaniel or a retriever, how would you define uh, a versatile hunting dog, Ed? 
Um, well, I, I define it really as to what to do. I wrote an article a long time ago called uh, The Yavka Browsund, The Versatile Hunting Dog. And I listed and it explained four things that, that a versatile hunting dog has to do. Um, one is that the dog is able to uh, shift gears. He can be slow and methodical when he has to be and quick and fast and, and get on something quick if he has to be that. He has to be able to go from one to the other without yeah. any command from anybody. So he has to be in control of his temperament. I, I'm thinking of a music analogy, and I won't bore everybody with them because I don't want to go yeah. deep into those weeds right now. But, yeah. uh, you know, one one manifestation of that, while it has very little to do with the actual ground speed, is moving from wide open cover to tight cover, you know, from prairie yeah. to woods, for example, and adjusting. Yeah. That whole flexibility thing uh uh, seems to carry through in virtually every challenge these dogs face. The dog has to has to also be be very cooperative. Yeah, cooperative. yeah. So so, just give us an example or two of that, Ed. Uh, what what well, does cooperation co really mean in the field? Uh, it means that the dog is interpreting what you want, probably before you're even thinking about it. He is uh, the dog is reading you and. And the dog is doing everything possible to help with you, help you work. He also does it with other dogs. Backing is a, is a sign of cooperation. Now, now is that a, a learned behavior or do, is that a genetic? Cooperation is 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 part of temperament. And temperament is it is a genetic determined determined thing. You don't teach temperament. Yeah, you can't so train temperament, and you can't train a dog to be cooperative. What you can do is enhance it by rewarding the dog when he does something that's cooperative. You, you mentioned uh, backing, but uh, a lot of us will never get to the point where that's as critical as some of the other more basic cooperation skills. I was out this morning with my young wire hair, and, and I noticed, and, I, and I'd been lax on this before, but I noticed that he He'll every he'll every so often he'll just look back at me. Uh, sometimes when we're out of sight from each other, he'll he'll move to a spot where he can see where I am, and exactly. you know, well, that that's one example. But give us another one or two that we can watch for and maybe even encourage somehow. Um, well, often when you you see a dog get, and he goes on point, he turns and looks at you. Now in in, in the AKC trials or the American field. That would be a fault. For a versatile hunting dog, it's an asset. It's a sign of cooperation. He's, he's saying, it's here, come and get it. Uh, another sign of cooperation is if you get to, um, like, say you're hunting down a fence row and you get to a tee. Now, the dog is cooperative. He'll stop and wait and look at you and ask you which way you want to go. Sure That's enough. Right. Yeah, I love it. And, uh, you know, you can watch that. Uh, the first wire hair I ever had, um, I used to think it was confusion, but it wasn't. He would stop and he would sit on his own. I never taught him to sit, but he would sit and look to me for direction. A lot like exactly. a, you know, a, a, a really hard wired uh, retriever would when you blew that long whistle. And I, yeah. I never appreciated it the way I should have, I guess. But uh, that was a long that, that, time ago. Yeah, these are the things that, that, that I look for. In, in a dog that I want to hunt with. You know, you are, you are like I said, most well-known uh, here in the bird dog world, in the States in particular, for for solving our behavioral problems in the pages of Gun Dog Magazine. And by the way, yeah. uh, again, I appreciate your help with, uh, with Manny many years ago. But you, yeah, you, must, you must have kind of a top 10 list of the most common... Uh, I guess I'll call them challenges readers come to you with. What would be towards the top of that list? Uh, at, for part of the time that I've been writing with, with Gundog, with the column, um, aggression was, 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 was the biggest problem. Yeah. Dogs fighting with dogs, dogs barking at people uh, and uh, challenging people and that sort of stuff. And now it's become more of anxiety, where the dog is 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 oh, 
not fearful exactly, but t- uh, sort of, uh, I don't know what I should be doing now. That kind of anxiety. Well, that that's a new one on me, and I, I find that one a little bit puzzling, um, you know, but I, I think I can guess why. But you tell us, what, what, why would a dog in this day and age be less confident, for lack of a better term? Well, mostly it's because of the handler, the owner. The dog doesn't give the dog enough of a structured life. The dog is is uh, um, is really somebody who's who's in 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 the, in the habit of wanting to do something, the same thing every day, the same way. Mess it up a little bit by changing the rules, then he's confused. So confusion is is one of the problems. Um, another problem is. Dogs taken from litter too early. We had we've had lengthy discussions about exactly that. Let's. You're very firm about this, and I'm glad you haven't changed your outlook on it. But lay it out from the beginning, Ed. You know, most of us go, and I, I know somebody in particular in Clear Lake, Wisconsin, going up to get their pup at 49 days old. That's seven weeks, exactly yeah. seven <laughs> weeks, not one day short, not one day long. Yeah, but you're, you're, I know. We've it, and, and uh, it happened here. Uh, uh, at midnight on the 49th day, the guys knocked on the door. You know, give us a, uh, what What was the basic impetus to that belief? Seven weeks, exactly seven weeks. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're an academic. You might have, for all I know, you wrote a paper yeah. on it. And there's been a lot of research on it. Done. Uh, mostly it started with, with the group at Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, there was a, um, a think tank there headed by John Paul Scott, and John Fuller, and uh, I, I've met both of these guys, and I, I knew them well. In fact, I almost went to work with Scott, but they didn't offer the degree I didn't have, <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't go there. Anyway, they, they, they worked out the social life of, of dogs, and it's, it's written all up in a book called um, Show, Genetics and Social Behavior of the Dog. So was their their thought was forty nine days is plenty in the litter and at day forty nine no, that what that, that wasn't their thing they said that at forty nine days um, on average the in, uh, the building up of fear fear doesn't start in a puppy until he's about in his sixth week and then fear starts to increase. And it keeps on increasing until about ten, the tenth week, and then it levels out. Then there is no more. So anything that happens before the six weeks is good stuff. At the same time, the desire to be with other dogs and that sort of stuff is at a high level at when you're up until about the sixth week, and then it starts to come down. And where these two lines cross is the forty ninth day. On average, but that's an average of hundreds and hundreds of dogs. Pfaffenberger, who is uh, famous for his uh, work with seeing eye dogs, uh, wanted dogs that were very people oriented. So he took, he preferred to take the dogs at about seven weeks. They're now taking them at five and a half weeks from litter, and most of them don't make it. That's, a lot of them do. Um, but most of them don't. And this is to keep the dog as a, more as a person-type dog than a dog-type dog. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, they, they learn to be a dog and learn how to interact with dogs from the 7th to the 10th to 12th week. But 10 weeks is usually in, in, enough. And here is that they're interacting with others of the same litter. They're learning how to start fights, how to stop fights. They're learning what the signals mean. And so they get out into the world, and they meet up with a strange dog. The dog gives a signal. They can interpret that signal and act accordingly. And if it's a belligerent signal and they want to turn it off, they can. If it's belligerent, they can fight back. It's socialization at its fundamental level, but we always associate socialization with dogs dogs plus humans, but they first have to learn how to 
interact with dogs. They have to learn to be a dog. Yeah. Yeah, the socialization with humans is not really socialization. It's actually, it's uh, really associative learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it's, a lot of it involves social type interactions. Well, like ho- care dependency hold- interaction, leader follower interaction, this sort of thing. These are social relationships. Got it. All right, don't go away. We have lots more to talk about, including one of my favorite places to hunt public ground in Nebraska. But before we get there, let's first welcome our newest podcast sponsor, Gunner Kennels. You know, I work with Yeti on the television side, and now I'm working with the Yeti of dog crates in Gunner Kennels. Addison uh, pretty much decided that he was going to protect his dog no matter what. In any case, he has come up with a rough, tough, most rugged dog crate I've ever seen. And you know, I've seen a few because I've talked about them. These guys are, as they say, the sine qua non of dog crates. You want to learn more about them, watch some of the videos. If you don't believe me, and I don't blame you, then watch the videos and see for yourself how gunner kennels survive the wickedest, ugliest, worst testing process you've ever seen. You might want to close your eyes once in a while. Learn more at gunner.com. And by the way, if you love taking pictures of your dogs, That is the one place you'll be able to win something. The next few days, their photo contest ends very soon. So get over to Gunner.com, say hello for me, and then enter the photo contest and watch some of those videos. And our good friends at Dogtra, thank you very much, Steve, and everybody else over there. The Dogtra T&B dual collar system is the one I use on Flick when I'm teaching steadiness and force fetching. Take a note here. S-L-U-N-10 is the exit code, the coupon code, if you will, for good for a 10% discount on anything over $200. bucks. you will also get free shipping on any purchase over $200. The Dogtra T&B Dual, no toggling back and forth. You don't need to touch a touch screen. There's two sets of buttons there, and if you use those buttons, one for one collar, one for the other collar, you don't have to even look at the handheld to control your dog, to train your dog, it's all the Dogtra TNB Dual Collar SLUN10 for a 10% discount. Take a look at that Dogtra TNB Dual. And finally, my friends at ESPAmerica.com. You know, I am wearing hearing protection every time I set foot in the field these days because, well, you know, it could be anything from the way the wind's blowing to how close your hunting buddy is. All of those things will affect your hearing, and it ain't positive. Because they're custom fit, ESP America hearing protection devices will not rattle out no matter what kind of rugged country you're hunting in. Wear them on the range, wear them in the field, If you're like me, maybe you wear them at home once in a while and turn the volume way down. But don't tell my spouse I recommended that. Learn more and shop to your heart's content on all varieties and all prices at ESPAmerica.com. So, this is our Handle It segment of the show where we ask the experts what they would do to handle the problem. And we're deep into it already. The Upland Nation and Ed Bailey. Ed, of course, a former professor, retired animal behaviorist at the University of Guelph, among other places. An avid, versatile hunting dog uh, aficionado, I guess I'll call it. And by the way, Ed, as a longtime member of NAVDA, uh, thank you for all your work in getting that organization founded and off the ground. Appreciate that. All right, Ed, so here we are. Um, Handle it. All about listener questions. One comes to us from Roger Miller. Hey, not that Roger Miller, but another one. He asks, (laughs) what the most important attributes of a pup are? So if you're looking at a litter and you're looking for the dog to bring home, and we all know there's a lot of protocol involved in all that, but if you had to, what would you look for in a seven, eight-week-old dog if you had the choice? First of all, I would go there at five weeks. I would, I would look at the dog at five weeks because at five weeks, fear hasn't developed. Yeah, so he's going to have, what, uh, a, a, a better, 
You're going to see him yeah. more at ease. Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, more, much more at ease. And when he's uh, he's not yet starting to be flighty like he is at seven and eight weeks, he uh, he has mobility. And what I would look for in in a, in a pup at that age is one that wants to come to you, wants to be with you, and uh, is not somebody who's standoffish. And what you should be doing at five weeks is picking up the pup all the pups that you'd be interested in, picking up and holding them and cuddling them and get them to smell you really well because at that age, you're forming a smell imprint in the dog and the dog will know that smell and be back at five weeks of age without fear. So when you get them, you get the pup home even at, at, eight, at ten, eight or 10 weeks, then he's, he knows you. He knows your smell, he smells you, he's happy. Well, uh, by the same token, should you be avoiding interacting with that dog as a six and seven week old dog? No, no, no. All right. No, if you're going, uh, you can go back at six and seven weeks old because now he knows you. Okay. All right. And, and then, then he's he's still he's still as far as he's concerned, without fear of your smell. I got it. So he's at home with you already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he, at six and eight weeks of age. Um, that again, you let them. I like to sit down in the grass with the puppies and just just let them run around. And pretty soon, one of them is going to be picking up a dead stick or a frog or whatever, and they bring it to you and sort of show and tell. And that's that's a sign of I'm a I'm already a cooperative puppy. That's not that not to say he's going to be an award winning retriever, but he is cooperative. That's right. He's, yeah. Nothing to do with retrieving. Yeah. It has to do only with cooperation. And, uh, and uh, as you said, we can't teach that. we got to just cultivate what we get there. Yes. Well. And that, that, uh, that's what I want. But I, I, I don't want a dog that uh, is a far-ranging dog. I want a, a, a hunting dog for the on-foot hunter. Right. We're not. This is what I would look for. Is if there... you're looking for something different. Okay, they, you, you wouldn't use these criteria, the mother criteria. But if you're looking for a great hunting dog that's also going to be a good citizen in the home and on the street when you take them to the shopping mall, that sort of thing. Yep. All right, what about that's the, the opposite? What, what puppy do we want to stay away from when we look at that litter? Um, the, 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 the one that, that will um, just wander off, ignore you totally, never bother with you. And if you go try to pick it up, at, at six or eight weeks of age, and you turn on you. You mean literally turn? Or, like, yeah, move away. Yeah, and yeah. bite at you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense, all the that, sense in the that world. Would be, that would be, that would be the, the far uh, out end of the spectrum. We, we watch a litter, and we see these pups interact with each other. Is there anything we can gather from that? Uh, not a whole lot, because that, uh, I had a student that worked on that and uh, um, studied uh, several litters of um, German shepherds. They were actually they weren't hunting dogs, but they were German shepherds. And and um, uh, she uh, she uh, videoed them all, and then re went back and studied the videos and, and re redid them again and again and again. And again. It took her longer, much longer, to analyze the videos than it did to do the original study, of course. But uh, she found that there was just no relationship at all between what the puppy is in the litter toward the other puppies and what it turns out to be as far as, as being a bully or uh, a timid dog or anything else with, with, with the others. The rank ordering that, that you might see in a litter of puppies at, at uh, six or eight weeks hasn't got anything much to do with what it's going to be as an adult. I see. And the other problem is they're, they're still working all of that out. They're, they're students of that. Be oh, yes. By the time you take them home, they're still not masters of it. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, once we've got our puppy home, Ed, what are the things that we should be working on uh, the, the first few weeks of a, of a, uh, of a transition from, from the litter and the kennel to our house that will be most valuable down the road? The first 
thing you do with a puppy when you get him home is to get him comfortable and get him a place that's his. Like a crate. Like in a kennel, in a crate, or, or if you don't have a crate, just a spot on the floor where he has his, a mat or a little cushion. But that's his spot, and it's inviolate. And by inviolate, I mean, do you mean we never go and grab him away from there? We don't. We don't. Yeah, I mean, you don't use it for punishment. You don't say go to your spot or something like that if it, if he's been bad. Uh, you don't use it as punishment. It's his security place. So how would how do we get him to stay there? Because <laughs> we're still working on it at my house. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one one thing you can do is is um, get uh, something like one of these Kong toys that you can stuff with cheese or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or uh, failing that, just uh, uh, one of these nylon bones, a big one, and drill holes in it and stuff cheese in the holes. So he has to work like the Dickens to get it out. And he's working right there at his spot the whole time. Always at his spot. Give it to him at his spot. Now, that's, that's where he works. And he'll work and then fall asleep. Yeah, uh, so they say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he will. And, oh, then, and then he'll, he'll wake up and you've you got to get him outside real quick. <laughs> You know, a, a lot of people suggest that there are certain things that need to be taught in a certain order with a young dog, whether it's uh, the use of nose, opening, uh, well, Larry Mueller calls the opening the nose. Others talk about how teaching him uh, no or whatever word you use for it. Others say it's learning his name. Uh, are there any of those that that we should really hit on early that uh, that uh, that may not be as obvious? You're doing them all together, really. Every every day, you're you're working with your dog. You're training your dog. Maybe inadvertently, but you are training him. Tell you one thing: you don't do is you, uh, if you give him a a spot that's fenced off, for example, you don't walk up to the to the fence and reach over so he has to jump up. Oh, I'm glad you told me that one. I wish you'd told me that about two years ago, though. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. what because that teaches him that teaches him right away okay if i'm going to get petted i have to jump up duh but we never think about that do we not in not with a fence or a barrier of some sort no so uh, what i always do is uh, if they're behind a barrier get down to the floor with them mm-hmm. lean way down and have my hands down at the floor so if he wants to get petted, he has to be on all fours. Yeah, I've I've talked about that actually in my book as well about um, when when you're in the same space with the dog, getting down that low, but never thought about the barrier as an encouragement for, in effect, violating the rule. Yeah, exactly. You're teaching him exactly what you don't want him to do. Well, let's take that dog, and he's now two years old, and uh, and we're hopefully f- uh, molding that dog into a decent, versatile hunting dog. Um, what what are the th- what are the f- the hardest to train parts of that dog's hunting career that we should be uh, focusing on with a you know a year old, a two year old dog? Well, even younger. By the, by that time, they should be essentially finished. Uh, two, by two years, um, some of the things you won't start doing until they're uh, at least uh, eight, nine months old, like retrieving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't start retrieving until I'm sure that they have all their permanent teeth. Oh, because it hurts to hold stuff, doesn't it? Well, not just that, but uh, when you're when they're teeth are coming out, coming loose, and, and new teeth coming in, they chew. Uh-huh. And everything's a chew toy. Yes. So you're teaching them to retrieve. They're chewing it. Yes. So now you've taught them very nicely to chew whatever they retrieve. Wow. And so if you if you wait until they have their teeth, they're all their permanent teeth and things are fine, then you can start teaching retrieve. I, I had another pro guide tell me once that, uh, you know, I was complaining about my dog not wanting to hold a frozen bird. And yeah. he, ma- he made a point that I'd never thought of before. Would you want to hold a frozen bird? It's like getting an ice cream headache, isn't it? Yeah. So I thaw all uh, my birds now. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I, I don't, I don't expose them to birds until uh, for retrieving until way, way later. And that's because. Now, um, I want them to know how to retrieve and how to hold things and and what pressure to put on it first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then go to the birds. Yeah. Good. Well. Whew. We did it right, so uh, we're okay yeah. on that. So uh, if I were in your class, I might get a good score on that. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just I just sent an article into um, the gun dog about hard mouth. Mm-hmm. I had a question about how how do you cure hard mouth in this dog that I have. So I um, uh, sent it as, as the column. If you teach a dog uh, retrieving by putting your hand in their mouth, the very first step, the dog no sit and to stay sitting uh, by your left knee or whatever, whichever side you want. And if it's on your left knee, you put your right hand in his mouth, palm up. And that's important. Dog. Yes, because if he bites too hard, you squeeze your hand together and pinch his lips against his teeth. Uh, and he relaxes the hold. Got if he's it. not holding hard enough, you push the back of your hand down toward the lower jaw, his reflex is to pull up and hold it tighter. Ed, this is why I called you, because those are golden. Those kind of tips, you could go to a hundred workshops and never hear that one. So that makes all the sense in the world to me, and I, I will probably steal it and use it at our next training day. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, and then, if you do get a dog that, that that learns uh, if you train them that way start, then they have to learn to reach for your hand and then you move your hand further and further down to the ground and they're retrieving your hand yeah and, and ultimately uh, they're whatever you use next you're holding anyway so they're kind of accustomed to moving toward your hand right exactly uh, then you go to a dummy of some sort i, I like to use wooden blocks wooden sticks you know doll pins about it, uh, mm-hmm. an inch or so diameter and you like wood as opposed to like the plastic or big round yeah cylinders yeah. Wood is not quite so slippery good point and and, and uh, uh i have the sticks in it to keep it so it doesn't lay flat on the ground and doesn't roll yeah um it's easy to pick up they have immediate success don't they yeah, yeah, and and without it rolling, they don't have the tendency to play with it. Another good point. Yeah. And they pick it up toward the middle of it. It's easiest. First with your hand, then with a, a retriever, a dummy thing, a, a block. Then gradually you lay it out further and further from him, send him out so he picks it up, keep him on the leash. First it's a six-foot leash, then get out to a 30-footer or a 50-footer the line, and always carry it out, lay it down, come back to him, send him out, get him on the line. He picks it up, but he's bringing it back, steer him in right around you, behind you, and sit, take it nicely in your hand. It's the easiest thing in the world to train. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) That's what they all say, Ed. (laughs) But But if you do it one step at a time and go from one thing to the X, uh, then you have a place to go back to if he, if he fails. Yeah, and, and, and actually I've written about that recently, about how you ha- there are peaks and valleys and plateaus, and sometimes you need to yeah. go back to square one, whatever you define as square one. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. And, and now if your dog does develop hard mouth, uh, then you take a bird, a small bird like a quail or something like that, that your hand covers have him retrieve your hand with the bird in it yeah he's less likely to bite hard absolutely that's right and then gradually show more and more of the bird and less and less of your hand so mm-hmm. he's retrieving less of your hand and more of the bird each time but making the transition of how hard you bite down yep well we're running short on time but i i gotta ask yeah. the, the the one Big question, and I promise we okay. won't end on on a negative. But what is the biggest mistake we dog owner self trainers make out there? I, I think it's it's mostly confusing the dog. Yeah, doing things that confuse the dog. 
When you say confused, when we talked about that earlier, um, I, yeah. I understand when a dog is just totally baffled because the, uh, of a number of variables out there. You're a scientist. You know how many variables there are in, in virtually yeah. any situation. Um, how, do we, how do we minimize that? Is it in clarity of communication? Is it in our expectations? How do we not confuse our dog any more than we have to? Well, by first doing everything in as controlled a situation as possible. So you do start everything in a small room that the dog is familiar with. Yeah. And then with, with no interference from anything, and gradually introduce more and more extraneous junk into the situation. One of the reasons I love NAVDA is uh, we can quite often, especially in a uh, training situation, we can have a mob scene behind us so the dog eventually gets used to all of that. And uh, exactly. at, at test time, of course, there's three or four or maybe even five or six people or a whole gallery tracking behind. So that that would be kind of one of the ultimate distractions mm -hmm. and confusing situations, but there's any number of them out there. And, and like you said, it starts small and, and you just take them through all those things. Yeah. What, what I think is, is every, and I tell it to almost everybody, is the first thing you do with your, with your puppy is enroll him in a good obedience class. Go through an obedience course. And I understand that. And, and that way you're exposing him to, to other people, other dogs, and, he's, and you're learning how to handle him in that situation. And just do the basic things like a level one or uh, maybe up to a level two and um, I, I took the, the dog that I have now he's now going to be 13 in a few weeks so he's uh, over it but I took him to an obedience class and he ran through level one level two level three he went through some agility stuff he went through some rally things and uh, it helped him immense, immensely. Then you go for the road to the real training, the hunting stuff. You know, but all of that, and, and, and you, you know exactly where I'm going with it. All, every one of those steps taught that dog how to think for himself, how to cooperate with others, and how to get yep. along in, in whatever kind of a crowd it was, dog or human. Yeah. And that... Yeah. That is a good place to end our discussion. That's Ed Bailey. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Ed, a behaviorist, founder of NAVDA, all sorts of other things. And you can find his column in Gundog Magazine all the time. It's, um, you know, it's so true. Teaching a dog or helping a dog uh, think in the ways we believe will help our cooperative spirit. Um, lots of great information there, Ed. It's a pleasure to talk with you again, especially not worrying about the, the issues of one of my dogs or another of my dogs. Thank you so much for joining us on the Upland Good Nation. To and that will call it a day for Ed, and I am so grateful to have spoken with him again. It's been a long time, and the guy's got insights up to yin-yang, and if you are in NABDA in particular, you owe him a debt of gratitude along with Bodo and a whole bunch of other folks in there. Okay, hold tight for our This Land is Your Land segment. It's coming up right after this. You know, when you head out for public access ground or anything else you are doing, you fuel up your truck with the highest quality gasoline or diesel. Well, you want to do the same thing with your dog. When you're headed out to public access land, you want to put Dr. Tim's performance dog food in your hunting partner. Tim Hunt is not only a musher and a performance dog aficionado, he is a veterinarian. This guy has done his homework. One of the things that I'm impressed with is how important he feels it is for metabolism adjustments to be reflected in the dog's fuel. So if your dog is being asked to do some incredible things in the field, then you want to make sure the formulation of his food is reflected in those expectations. The rate 
by which food transits the body, for example. And you know what I mean there. You put it in one end, you want it out the other end at the right time. Learn more about his food at drtims.com. And once you do, you will apply that 30% discount on your first order because you are an Upland Nation listener. That's the code, Upland Nation, and you'll get your 30% off. Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. You know, the song goes, this land is your land, and it is, and this is my chance to share with you some of the places I love to go that you might be able to go to as well, trying to cover the gamut in that regard. Got to put in a plug for Sydney, Nebraska right now. It's more than the mothership for Cabela's, who I thank every day for their sponsorship of my television show. When I'm out there, I, 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 try, I do my best to carve out a couple days to hunt right in the neighborhood because there's all sorts of public access around Sydney, Nebraska. If you want to get all the details, go to the website outdoornebraska.gov. There's a where to hunt button and you can get the maps, you can get the atlas. There's all sorts of things you can learn, especially the, um, the good stuff. And if you were in Sydney and I was with you and you wanted to kill a pheasant down there, I'd send you toward the Colorado state line. So you're going generally south from Sydney. Some of the blue spots on the map down there are well worth a look. Also toward Chapel. It's a little town a little bit further east, but all within commuting distance of Cabela's and the Cabela's RV Park, all this, all the restaurants, all the shopping. Best pizza in the Midwest is down by the railroad tracks in Sydney, Nebraska. Not a bad town and not a bad place to take a look at some public access hunting ground as well. Okay, so... Now that you're fueled up and ready to roll, let me remind you that I've got some other suggestions for you at findbirdhuntingspots.com. That's the new website with all sorts of suggestions for you about places to go that cost you nothing except boot leather and truck fuel. Findbirdhuntingspots.com. Got some new videos up there, some new articles on places to go and how to get there. And that is one way to win that pointer over and under shotgun. Just sign up with a mailing list. And don't forget that when you go out into the field, you need hearing protection as much as you do on the range. There may not be quite as many shots, but every one of those shots is going to take a little bit off your hearing acuity. ESPamerica.com is where you learn more about ESP hearing protection devices. And thank you for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. We're right at the nub here. I'm going to be saying goodbye. Yay! Maybe you're <laughs> anxiously awaiting my departure. I hope not. If you'd like to talk with me more, of course, you can talk to me at the Upland Nation Facebook page. I'm also hanging out, of course, at the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Learn more about the show and all sorts of other stuff at UplandNation.com. Please subscribe, rate, or review. It really does help. And that's another way to enter to win that pointer over under shotgun. It's all at UplandNation.com, a good place to start. I hope you'll share that with friends. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. Thank you again, Ed Bailey. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day in the field.